Welcome to this training session on Wyland Topologies from Arrowhive. In this training session we are going to cover stations and access points, service sets, roaming basics, layer 2 roaming, layer 3 roaming, and hopefully answer some of the questions you may have about these topics. Stations and access points must contend for the medium in the same manner. According to the standard, they're actually called access point stations and non-access point stations for this reason. When we think of stations, we normally think of some type of client device, such as a barcode scanner or a laptop or a tablet or a phone, uh, but the access points do have to act just like the clients in respect to gaining access to the medium. They must perform clear channel assessments and if the medium is not idle they must back off and defer until the medium is idle. Access points perform additional functions beyond that of the client. They act as the point coordinator for the service set and they allow, as their name implies, access to the bounded medium. Client stations, which are again defined as non-access point stations by the standard, can be any number of device types. Most people, being users, would think of laptops, but it could be iPads, it could be scanners, printers, phones, and they may be associated with an AP or they may be part of an ad hoc network, meaning they're associated to another client and in ad hoc networking there is no point coordinator and no centralized point of authentication or accounting, but they would still be acting as stations if they are in such a network. Service sets. There are different types. There's an independent basic service set, basic service sets, extended service sets, and a mesh basic service set. An independent basic service set is what we traditionally refer to as an ad hoc network. Basic service sets are access points and any associated clients. Extended service sets are multiple access points using the same SSID and same security principles. And a mesh basic service set is a group of APs that are meshed together to form a mesh network. Independent basic service sets are ad hoc networks or for peer-to-peer -peer wireless connectivity. There is no access point here and they're made for a temporary configuration. There's also no centralized authentication and because of that they are considered to be largely less secure than a standard infrastructure based network. Anyone with admin rights on their device can join an ad hoc network. Ad hoc networks can be made more secure by using WPA2 with a very long complex pre-shared key and AES encryption. Unfortunately, most of the users who set up ad hoc networks are not familiar enough with advanced security, so they'll just simply create an ad hoc network with no security turned on whatsoever. You may have seen an ad hoc SSID of free public Wi-Fi. That's a very common name used by people trying to play around and, and trick other people into connecting to them, but when you connect, you'll see that it is a non-secured computer-to-computer -computer network and a savvy user will realize that if it's a computer-to-computer -computer network I'm probably not getting to the internet and they won't connect but others will. You could use an ad hoc network for legitimate purposes for very quick file sharing when you don't have a thumb drive or a crossover cable or the ability to use a network share of some type it could be used to combine things such as internet connection sharing for a small environment to let other devices out but it is not really used uh, in the enterprise by design it is normally just something that is a one-off among users and it is considered to be a security hole in the enterprise it should be discouraged if you can possibly configure the supplicants not to be able to enter an ad hoc network that would be a safer configuration a basic service set is really the, the beginnings of an enterprise wireless network. You'll have an access point connected to the distribution system and client devices connecting to the access point. The basic service set is the foundation topology of a wireless local area network. 
the basic service set area is the physical area of coverage provided by an access point within a basic service set and what that really means is it's the cell size of the access point so as far as the access point can effectively work and hear things would be the basic service set area the SSID and the BSSID the SSID is a logical name given to an infrastructure network or even an ad hoc network the BSSID the basic service set identifier is the MAC address of the access points radio that is being used with that SSID if you're only using one SSID on your access point the MAC address of the radio is normally the BSSID when using multiple SSIDs from the same radio the MAC address is going to be skewed a little bit from the basic address normally the bulk of it looks the same as the MAC address but the last couple of digits have been altered or incremented based on the number of the SSID that is being supported off of that radio multiple basic service set identifier multiple basic service set identifier is just as the name implies a multiple basic service set identifier you're going to be using the same radio but producing different SSIDs from it internally each SSID is acting logically as if it were a separate access point but they are sharing the same physical radio for the access point so in this example you can see we have three different SSIDs one for data one for voice and one for guest however we only have one access point being used when the access point is beaconing or sending signals to the clients they need to find the SSID that is associated with that particular access point when you look at the SSID for data if you look in the chart in the upper right hand corner you will see that the SSID for data we'll call that the first SSID is actually using the same MAC address as the physical radio the SSID for voice which would be the second SSID is using almost the same address you can see just the last piece of the MAC address has been changed the guest SSID or the third SSID on the radio again is using almost the same MAC address as the base radio in the system but it is altered slightly by altering that you provide a separate basic service set identifier so that each of those can be associated with the appropriate SSID providing activity and connections for clients which are looking for connectivity at layer 2 to different MAC addresses an extended service set is one or more access points connected to the same distribution system and that is normally done to extend the coverage area or provide an opportunity for roaming notice in this illustration we have basic service set area 1 BSA 1 and basic service set area 2 BSA 2 the APs are connected to the same Ethernet backbone so a client that is connected to AP 1 has an opportunity to roam to AP2 as the user moves across that boundary but still maintaining connectivity to the same Ethernet infrastructure that is an extended service set there is not necessarily a requirement for the access points to share the same SSID or the same security principles they just have to be connected to the same distribution system but it is more commonly implemented that all of the APs that are part of the same extended service set use the same SSID and the same security principles roaming basics when clients connect to an AP they are called associated when they move throughout the physical area and are receiving a stronger signal or a more preferred SSID the client can select to roam when the supplicant or the client roams is based on the criteria on the client side 
802.11f was a recommended practice for roaming. 802.11r is a ratified amendment to the standard for roaming. However, most supplicant manufacturers still manufacture their clients to roam in a proprietary manner. Some clients will roam based on a better signal strength. Some will roam to a more preferred SSID. Some roam based on the amount of available bandwidth or data rates they're able to use. That's all up to the client. When I'm moving within a same infrastructure and I'm physically moving around, I want to make sure that I'm able to connect properly. So I'll need to make sure that my access point cell sizes overlap enough to allow the clients to properly roam. I want to make sure I have the overlapping coverage, not just for roaming, but also for resiliency in the event that a single AP goes down. When I move from one AP to another with a layer two roam, I'm going to send a reassociation request to the second access point. Inside that reassociation request is the basic service set identifier or the MAC address of the last AP to which I was connected. Different roaming mechanisms exist on the client side and different handoffs exist on the AP side. But it is important to remember that the decision to roam, if it is ever made, is made by the client and not the access point. Enabling load balancing among the access points in an Arrowhive network is done in a manner that encourages the clients to roam to access points that have a smaller connection or when they first associate to connect to an AP that has a lower number of clients connected. However, that encouragement is not forced it is simply a method of trying to encourage the client to pick the access point that is going to give them the best service based on their physical location and the number of other devices that are being serviced in that area. But it is not enforced. The client could still choose on its own to roam or not roam based on the criteria of that particular chipset's uh, rules of how it likes to roam. There is nothing the AP can do to force a client to roam. The AP has to make that choice. Some clients are sticky clients, which means once they've connected to an access point, as long as they can still hear that access point, even if it means they're going to drop down to a one megabit data rate, they're going to stay connected to that access point. Some supplicant software will let you go in and adjust the roaming aggressiveness so you can make the client want to roam more often or less often but still the criteria of when to roam is proprietary and it is built into the chipset it's not something that the APs can really determine. A layer 2 roam. I have a client that is associated to an access point and depending on the type of security model I'm using I may have a lot of extra authentication to go through but I'm going to have my pairwise master key, my pairwise transient key, my groupwise transient key, all of the appropriate keys are distributed. In an Arrowhive network, the access points predictively push their keys and session state to what are called one hop neighbors, APs that can be heard by the AP to which the client is originally connected. By pushing the keys to other APs, it makes roaming faster for the client because when the client physically moves over to an area covered by another AP and sends a reassociation request to that second AP, the process of reestablishing the keys does not have to occur because the keys were predictively pushed to one hop neighbors. Now that that client is connected to the second AP, it will push the keys to its one hop neighbors, meaning it may go back to the AP where it was originally connected, or there may be a third AP that the first AP could not hear because that would have been a two hop neighbor. A layer three roam is more challenging. If this were in a controller based network, the controller would know which APs the clients were connected to and keep track of it but then you would have data tromboning and a slower network and additional licensing fees. It's not a very efficient means of conducting networking. With the Arrowhive solution, a station connects to the first AP and the keys are established. 
when it moves to the second AP after the keys are pushed the key is already there now I have a one hop neighbor on a different subnet if this voice call crossed a router it would be on a new layer 3 network and when you cross that layer 3 boundary quite often you drop calls or have other problems with the Arrowhive solution the next one hop neighbor on the second subnet would get the key the client would roam over for a layer 2 roam upon roaming over for the layer 2 roam a dynamic GRE tunnel is created back to the AP on the subnet where the client came from starting on the AP that they are now connected to on subnet B. Now if I've connected that way having that tunnel back it allows the client to keep the same IP address. I've made a layer 2 roam tunneled my layer 3 traffic back over a GRE tunnel so that I can keep my same IP address and I don't lose my call or cross a layer 3 boundary. As I move from the first AP on the second subnet to another AP on that subnet, the GRE tunnel is moved as well and it will create a, a tunnel back from the second AP to the AP on the original network. If there's not enough traffic being passed between the client and the AP to make it look like they're really in an active call any longer, then the AP on subnet B will send a deauthentication frame to the client, shut down the GRE tunnel, and if the user needs to make an additional call, they would associate to an AP on the subnet where they are physically located, and I wouldn't need to worry about the layer 3 roam anymore. Mesh basic service sets. We have mesh points and mesh portals. A mesh portal is a Hive AP that has an Ethernet connection back to the network. A mesh point is a Hive AP that does not have an Ethernet connection and has used one of its radios to mesh to another access point so that the client's traffic can go through the APs and gain access to the wired network. The client will connect wirelessly to an access point. That access point could be servicing clients on 2.4 gigahertz and meshed on 5 or servicing clients on both 2.4 and 5 and meshed on 5. The mesh can be set up purposely or it can be set up dynamically if a mesh portal loses its Ethernet connection the device will automatically try to mesh to other Hive APs in the area on the 5 gigahertz radio. User traffic when the client is in a mesh is still routed back out to the wired network but it is via the mesh from AP1 to the second AP and then out the second AP's Ethernet connection to the backhaul. Uh, that reduces installation cost if I purposely need to mesh. Uh, imagine you're in a school system and you have modular classrooms. The modular classrooms would require an Ethernet connection for all of their APs which could be an expensive process given that the modular classrooms may be moved at the end of the semester or quarter to another school based on student population. Rather than doing that, you could place an AP170, which is our outdoor model, outside of the school and then have APs connecting to it via a mesh link so I wouldn't need to run the Ethernet cables out and when it was time to move the modular classrooms I would simply remove the access points and I would not have to worry about having additional cabling cost. Mesh access and 5 gigahertz on each Hive AP is a portal. By default every Hive AP selects a different channel for its mesh and it's going to use that for its mesh interface if they are portals so that more bandwidth is available for clients. That means that I'm going to support clients by default in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. If I have to mesh, I'm going to mesh in 5 gigahertz because 5 gigahertz is normally cleaner and I can still support clients in 5 gigahertz and support the mesh better than I can in 2.4 
because in 5 gigahertz I'm going to be using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing whether I'm using 802.11a or 802.11n. In 2.4 gigahertz I could be using direct sequence spread spectrum because of distance and it would slow down the network. In the diagram above, you can see that each access point in 5 gigahertz has selected a different channel. However, if a mesh is required to be formed, the radios must be on the same frequency to hear each other for meshing. So you will see the same channel used on multiple APs in an area where you're using meshing, and it creates a co-channel cooperation opportunity as well as providing the mesh in the event that the wired connection goes down or does not exist. It's an automatic failover. Other vendors radios do not have this automatic failover. You would have to purposely dedicate the radio to meshing functionality and it would not be able to support clients. Aerohive APs can do both. If the mesh opportunity is required then I would see here like we have in the diagram here we would have some mesh points and some mesh portals together with the Ethernet existing on some APs but not others. You see the channels now have changed so that we have APs on the same channel in the same basic service set area. That is so they can talk to each other. There is no magic, I'm a mesh and I'll stay on one channel while you're a mesh point and you stay on the other channel. They have to be on the same channel in order to communicate just like clients have to be on the same channel as the AP to communicate. This channel map is showing two Hive APs using channel 153 and two Hive APs using channel 161 which provides double the bandwidth uh, that you would have on a single channel mesh solution. But if I had a single channel mesh solution all of the APs would have to be on the same channel and that would create a lot more uh, co-channel interference or co-channel cooperation that would be necessary for the area when you have the opportunity to use multiple channels this way. Thank you for watching this session on wireless topologies brought to you by Aerohive. Please continue the rest of the series at your earliest convenience.